All right. Um, well, we're not in April yet. Let us imagine that it is the 14th day of, of April 1669, which is the 40th birthday of Christian Huygens, um, who is about to make a stream of brilliant contributions to physics, astronomy, and mathematics. There we go. Um, approximately around this time, that is not long thereafter, Huygens became the first person ever to determine the distance to a star other than our sun. He wrote this in this book, which is a book that he wrote for his older brother, Christ uh, uh, Constantine Jr. Um, the manuscript is 1695, which is the year of Huygens' death, so he never saw it in print. Um, the first Latin printing was three years later, 1698, and the first English translation was 1698. Uh, those of you who are Dutch in the audience, um, the first Dutch translation was 1754. And that just simply shows that, you know, what uh, science means for the typical Dutch person hasn't really changed very much in the last few centuries. Anyway, um, let's go back to pro what the original the problem was. Um, Aristotle of Samos was the first person that we know of who postulated that stars are distant suns. Now, there is an immediate objection to this, and that is something that you can try in the audience, right? We have already seen, that it had already been seen, that Earth orbits the Sun, this particular thing. So, if Earth orbits the Sun, and you are a nearby star, and the other people over there are distant stars, I see you all with respect to the background. That is not observed. And therefore, people said, it could not possibly be that stars are distant suns, because, you know, we should see them move as Earth moves through space. But this is one of the pages of a later manuscript from Aristotle. Huygens was the first person who actually gave a quantitative answer to the question, how far is a star? And he wrote this down in these five pages of this, the Dutch translation of his book, Cosmo Theoros, pages 191-95, if you want to look it up. And that's what I want to talk about. Translated, it says, since the stars are stated, are so many suns, then assuming that one of these is as large as the sun, with large here really means as luminous as the sun, we'll be coming back to that later, is as large as the sun, then its distance will be so much greater than that of the sun, as its apparent diameter is smaller than that of the sun. Look, if the sun is nearby, it looks big. And if the, sun is, if the star is a sun that is far away, it looks small. And the distance to the sun is inversely proportional to the angular size of the star. Now, this is the Camus Mirror, this is the, um, the big dog in the sky, this is the star Sirius, and this is the brightest star in the sky. And um, Huygens thought of something that is so totally simple that it is absolutely fantastic. Consider, this is the sun, that they have us. Um, <laughs> and I was asking so how could you possibly improve on Aristotle? Well, you do the following. You take a small pinhole and you project that pinhole onto the sun. Now, if you make this pinhole so small that it looks like a star, then it is not too difficult to calculate how far that star could be because it's just simply the ratio of the sizes, the angular sizes of these two. So, what he did is he made a telescope tube with a small pinhole and with a pinhole he looked at the sun and asked himself how small does the pinhole be so that that pinhole when I point this tube in the direction of the sun it looks as bright as Sirius at night. Of course that is not very quantitative but it's a start. Now, I experimented to find out how I could reduce the diameter of the sun in such a way that my eye would perceive no brighter a light than the dog star, that is serious, than the dog star or any other of the brightest stars. He took a tube here of 4 meters long and a pinhole of 0.18 millimeters in size. And with that, he looked at the sky. Now, he knew, of course, that the, sun, the, the eye must be dark adapted in order to get a reasonable idea of what the star looks like. So, so he wrapped his head in cloth here. You can imagine, you know, one of the greatest scientists that ever lived 
with the sort of stuff around his face. <laughs> that looked at the sun. Um, what happened is the following. He found 1 in 182 for the ratio that you need to observe. I saw a piece of the sun, the diameter of which was in one part in 182 of its total diameter, or in astronomical units, that is 10 seconds of arc. However, what he concluded is, I found this pinhole to be much brighter than the dark star shines at night. Just you try to make a pinhole smaller than 0.18 of a millimeter. That's not very easy. So you think, okay, I'm stuck, you know, it doesn't really work. And now comes a flash of genius. How can you make a hole smaller than a pinhole? Well, wow. what he did is the following. Therefore, seeing that the apparent size of the sun should be made much smaller, I contrived that by placing in the pinhole a small glass bead that I had used before as a magnifying glass. A very, very small spherical piece of glass, and he put that in his pinhole. Why did he do that? Because he knew that if you put that little piece of glass over there, most of the rays of the light get deflected away from the line of sight. It's not too hard to compute what happens when light falls into a sphere. And you can see from this that most of the rays disappear to the side and only very, very, very few going on. From the basic laws of optics, they can then conclude that the beam reduction factor is 1 in 152. When you multiply these things, you get the following. Computing according to the laws of optics, the diameter of the sun was reduced to 150 second of that 180 second part, the 180 second we just had. You multiply the two. And what you get? The sun thereby being so reduced that its diameter is 1 in 27,664 of what we see in the sky. It has an amount of light left over that corresponds to the brightness of the dark star. So, this improved instrument, and this is really what it was, it was an improved instrument with this little piece of glass in front, allowed him to determine 27,664 that distance to Sirius. Therefore, if the dark star be equated to this, it follows that the diameter of the dark star is the same, which its distance is 27,664 times that from us to the sun. For the first time ever in the history of planet Earth, a reasonable estimate was made of the distance to a star. That number, 27,664, the first time ever. Let us see how this compares with what we know about the star Sirius today. An astronomical unit, the distance from the Earth to the Sun, if you multiply that by 206,000, you get one parsec, which is the astronomical unit of distance that we use in our galaxy. 27,664 astronomical units is 0.13 parsec. So 0.13 parsec should be the distance of Sirius. However, Sirius is just over 25 times brighter than our Sun. I often didn't know this. By the way, if you read his stuff carefully, he is explicit about the fact that he assumes that all those stars are approximately as luminous as the Sun. He didn't know any better, of course, but he stated this explicitly. We now know that there's approximately 25. Now let us see what happens. Huygens' distance then is 25 times 4.13 by today's measure is 3.3 parsec, the distance to the star Sirius. What is the distance to Sirius that we know? The distance to Sirius actually is 2.67 parsec. So within 20%, the first determination ever of a distance to a star other than our sun was found by Huygens. All I can say then, yes, that it's a small bead for a scientist and a great ball for science. <laughs>
right, thank you very much. Then we're open to questions. Yeah? Uh. So, so how did how it's correct for the fact that our eyes are much more sensitive at night than during daytime? Like how did the camera can observe the sun and series at the same time? Mm -hmm. In, uh, that's a good question. In, in, in Cosmos to the Oros, um, he does argue precisely this point, and that is why he swaddled his head, his head in, in, in cloth. In the, in the book, he doesn't say how long it took to get dark adapted under those circumstances. Right? We know, however, that you're simply closing your eyes and the sunshine doesn't really help. So, I still have somewhere on, on my to do list, on my bucket list, as it were. Uh, doing the experiment myself, but I haven't gotten around to that yet, but your point is well taken. Yeah, great, in the back, you, you're going to have to shout a little because the string is not long enough. Yeah, it's okay. I was wondering about if uh, Hubbins uh, knew about the diffraction effect and if he took that into account uh, with a small pinhole. Um, no, he did not. Um, that's actually a surprise. Um, around about the, as you possibly know, um, in Huygens' book Traité de la Lumière, the treatise on light, um, he made a hypothesis that explained the motion of light right up to the point that it was discovered that light is a wave rather than a shock, in, rather than a shock in, in matter. Um, However, around about the time, there were a French and an Italian researcher who did see the diffraction fringes on the side of a sharp knife edge. So it was approximately known. Hertz did not take this into account. Um, it's a good point that what you say saying. Uh, for, the, for the pinhole itself, it is something that has to be considered. So his number 182 needs a correction. However, if you put the glass bead in there, then you don't have edge rays anymore, and then the problem doesn't occur. Thank you. Another one in the back? Uh, yeah, I'm just wondering, how did he figure out like the quantitative aspect of light coming from the sun or from Sirius? Like, was he just estimating that based on what he saw, or was there some mechanism they used to measure how much light was coming through the telescope, how much light was impact on a piece of film or something like that. If I understand your question correctly, but correct me if I'm if I'm getting this wrong, right? Um, in in Hertz's time there was no such thing as photometry. So there's just totally no way in which they could determine quantitatively how much radiation comes from any any given a given object. There are ways of sort of doing this, but they have very, very low accuracy. Right. So I'm afraid that the answer is no, he couldn't do that. It's just subjective. No, I, I don't think he could do that. No, so you have completely had to rely um, on the sensitivity of his eye, and then your problem again comes in, but that, that he took into account by getting dark adapted. Yes. <coughs> Any final questions? Yes? Um, maybe a bit technical, but I'm just wondering, you said that um, the luminosity of Sirius is 25 something times the luminosity of the sun. Uh, why can't you just multiply the, the distance that he estimated by that factor? Since in my in my mind right now the luminosity decreases with the square of the distance, not linearly. Ah yes. Um, let's see if I can get that straight just a moment, please. The argument then is that um, a um, this is what you have, right? Now, the um, the intrinsic the, the, you have yeah two things: the apparent angular size and the brightness of the little spot that you have in that angle. Okay, so the luminosity is what counts. All right, not the apparent luminosity. The apparent luminosity has already been taken care of because of that extra distance. Right. Okay. Yes. All right. Let's give it up again for. Uh,